Hey, good afternoon and welcome to our next Women Lead webinar series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Michelle Berquist, your host and moderator today, as we're delighted to bring another amazing Women Lead webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Just as a little note, remember our Women Lead webinars are designed for you as the professional leader in business, whether you are a business owner, you are an aspiring woman leader, or if you are an absolute leader, veteran leader in what you do. Our goal is to select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. A couple of logistics is that our webinars are just shy of one hour, and at the half hour mark, we're going to be answering any questions um, that all of you have submitted online during the presentation portion of our webinar. I am delighted to say that we have an amazing topic today and an amazing female leader and thought leader today, but our topic and title is Learn 10 Secrets to Transform Your Lifestyle Business to a Million Dollar Enterprise. And I'm excited to introduce our thought leader today, who is somebody I know pretty well, and she's an amazing powerhouse. Kim Folsom, who is the co-founder and CEO of Lift Development Enterprise and Founders First Capital Partners, is our thought leader. And there is a lot of stuff about Kim that you need to know, but I'm going to hit the highlights. She's not only the founder of Lift Development Enterprises, but she's also the CEO and co-founder of Founders First Capital Partners, which is a small business growth accelerator and a program that I personally have gone through um, for Connected Women of Influence. And it was amazing the things that came out of it. She's also, <clears throat> what they also do is they help fuel small business expansion for women-led, revenue-based, and they have a revenue-based venture fund that focuses on underserved, employer-based micro-businesses. And I think all of us are going to get some fabulous information. You can read more about Kim later. Kim, I want you to say hello to all of our listeners. And my dear, let's start this webinar. Well, good morning and hello, and I'm so excited to be with you all today. Thanks so much, Michelle, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak to your group. Um, I'm excited to, to share um, some information and insights uh, from my journey with um, running both Lyft and Founders First. And uh, our topic today is the how to transition from your lifestyle business to get on the path to being a, what we consider a $10 million enterprise. Now listen, oh, there, there's a delay. That's right, you told me. That. Okay, all <laughs> there right. There we go. All right, so um, uh, what we're gonna cover today is uh, six items. First, we're gonna have, um, a, uh, you know, talk about why you might consider doing this. Next is visualizing running a $10 million business. And, and many people have the challenge, and I'll talk about my, my own personal challenge and my family with this view. We're going to go through a little bit of history challenge and opportunity for women business owners. Then we're going to, you know, get to the meat of some, t uh, the 10 uh, keys to tr making that transformation. I'm going to uh, highlight a few companies that have gone through that have gone through some of this transformation are on the path to doing this, and then I'm, we're going to do a wrap up and uh, share a few gifts with you. So with that, uh, we're going to jump into well, why would you consider doing this? You know, you're you're great. You've got this great lifestyle service based business. You know that either you uh, plan to be an entrepreneur or you are accidentally entered into it. You're following your passion any of those number of things. So, you know, as many of the people who've gone through our programs, you know, one, they either said, you know, I've got this problem. I don't see anyone solving it satisfactorily to my, my uh, design. So that's why I'm going to start my business. But then the other side of it, why you might consider doing something at a larger scale is the impact to your community. You know, as a job creator, thought leader, um, really influencer, that when you get to that seven and, you know, if you're lucky, eight-figure business, your impact to your overall community is just phenomenal. The other is um, you may be in the position that are, you're a provider for your family. And it may be that you're doing this um, for your immediate family, um, but or extended. You know, you may have grandkids or whatever, and you're seeking to, you know, put them in school or you're you know, elderly parents that you may be um, having to be responsible for some aspect of their support. 
um, you know, when you're doing this or if you have that pressure, that's where, you know, uh, growing is key. The next is, you know, when you think about retirement for you or your family, you know, um, one of the exercises we do in our program is we talk about, you know, when do you think that you're going to, you know, exit uh, your exit plan, not just uh, for your business, but personally. And, you know, women live a long time. These days, women are li li uh, living on average 85 years old. So when you think about where you are today and where you're going to go, how are you going to make that journey? And then the last piece of it is thinking about the legacy for you and your family once you leave. You know, there may be things that you want to contribute to or support them or pr put them in a position that may be different than what you had or, or maybe you want to continue on that path. So those may be some drivers that um, to think about, you know, why you might look at thinking a, a bigger vision than where you have for your business. And then the other, you know, last piece is the re retirement side of it. You know, when you think about sufficient funds, reserves um, to, to uh, support your desired lifestyle, um, you know, do you, what you desire to do with your business uh, you know, once you decide that you're done with it, you know, 70% of businesses just, you know, file for bankruptcy and they're done. Um, so, you know, if you don't think about what you're going to do, uh, if you want to think about it for retirement, you need to have it be of at least, um, you know, three, ideally five million and up in order to sell it on to someone else. And then the last piece of it is when you think about you know, today running your business, you are, you know, a significant, you know, decision maker uh, with what you do. And uh, if you decide or what you want to transition beyond this, uh, you know, and you don't want to find another job, then, then you know, the other side of it, that, those are another reason why you might consider, um, you know, thinking bigger. So I'm going to go through and assume that after this conversation that are uh, these points that you've all said, yep, I definitely want to consider that. So uh, transitioning uh, back 45 years ago, um, this on the right here is a picture of my mom and dad, believe it or not. And my dad was a 22-year uh, uh, military um, uh, uh, officer. He was an enlisted officer. And, you know, he, after 22 years, he achieved the highest rank in the Navy for enlisted officer. He was an engineer and then afterward became an educator in uh, what was then the Navy's uh, diversity and inclusion program, which believe it or not, in 73, they actually had one of those programs. Well, he told my mom, I want to become a business owner um, as part of my plan to transition out of the military. And my mother was like, what? You know, there's all kinds of civil service jobs that you could take on as part of your transition, you know, given your career and your, you know, your training and all that other stuff. And so she wasn't having it. She was like, you know what, the only <laughs> man that I'm familiar with is either George Jefferson or Fred Sanford. And that's not what I signed up for. So, you know, I, um, I'm not having it. So uh, it was a really significant bone of contention in our family. But that inspired me because in my career, I started my career as a software engineer, transitioned after after about eight years to running my first company, eventually launched six of them, exited three. <clears throat> but after I was in my sixth company, I found that there wasn't a lot, you know, in, in the companies I ran, most of them, I grew them to between five to 10 figures, uh, and, or five to 10 million in revenue, and had raised, you know, a significant amount of money, um, over 30 million in venture, and actually found out, didn't know this, that I was one of three African-American women who had done this. Um, but when I, you know, looked at my colleagues, you know, especially women and uh, other women business owners, not very many, many of them were running companies that were seven and eight figures. Most of them were struggling, you know, running a five to six figure business. Some of them, you know, didn't think about, you know, that's what they wanted to do. Others, you know, did, but, you know, Given my, um, I guess, prior, you know, corporate career working in mostly innovative companies, I started with ATM systems, and then by the time I left, it was um, uh, uh, wireless uh, data systems, that most of them, I was surrounded around people who aspired to grow what are categorized today as unicorn businesses, those that are billion-dollar businesses. 
And your life, your quality of life is so different when you are running a larger businesses than not. I mean, the reality is business owners, you struggle, you have stress with be it um, employees, customers, partners, you know, and then you've got your personal life going through that as well. Um, but, you know, if you're going to go through and do it, you might as well do it so that there's a better path at the end of the tunnel and that it's not so much uh, just struggle along the way. And I'll tell you, in my journey, you know, most of the people that I was around that were in a similar position as me were guys. You know, you see the stories of guys. You know, people think of when you think of a CEO running a seven or eight figure company, it's mostly guys. Um, it's not a function that women can't do it. It's just being able to be in a nurturing environment that supports them thriving. And, and one side of it's capital and then the other side of it's a few other things. So, you know, you think about small businesses, they really are the embodiment of the American dream. You know, they are not just because, you know, everyone thinks of these people as heroes, and largely in this country they do, but they're also the biggest job creation engine. And, and with the fact that, you know, women being able to be in the position of leadership and controlling their de destiny, as well as access to money, that being the driver of a small business is a really big factor that allows that to happen. Um, but unfortunately, that uh, success that you know everybody talks about when you think about the stories of either Steve Jobs or Henry Ford, but Ford or Ray Kroc, um, you know, when you look at that with regards to women-led uh, businesses, it's not equivalent across the board. Um, unfortunately, the underserved and underrepresented market, and this is not just you know women, but it's women and minorities and veterans, LGBTQ. Um, people in low to moderate income areas that aren't like based in either the Bay Area or New York, you know, their journey running a business is not like, you know, the Steve Jobs or, you know, those types of stories. Although women are starting businesses, you know, at three to five times the rate of, of men, most of their businesses stay tiny. Um, on average, uh, the average revenues for these businesses are about 144000 um, less than 1% of women own businesses that are a million revenue or more. And then when you look at it from a 10,000, um, excuse me, it's a million um, business level, it's even much smaller than that. And so that has an implication when you think about the jobs and the revenues that this, uh, this allows for women to, to, to create. Um, some additional symptoms for that micro businesses, you know, when you look at that, most uh, women-led uh, businesses um, are between 50,000 annual to at most a half million in revenue. And they run into growth challenges, you know, and many of these challenges can be seen in, front, in the uh, element of little or no cash reserves. So unfortunately, you know, you don't have that acorn to help you get over those, what I call those oh shit moments where, you know what, gosh, you know, this check didn't come in while I planned or something else happened. Um, so, you know, that's one. The other is overwhelming uh, issues with serving the customer. Um, you're just focused on serving your customer that, you know, you can't really kind of look up and see what's going on. So you kind of have what I call the hamster syndrome. Uh, the other is that you're so uh, copying what somebody else, you don't really have a significant, unique um, value proposition. So when someone says, well, how different are you than A, B, C, D, you know, go on and on and on, then you're more like a sheep just following other people than being uh, unique. Uh, the other is the challenge of dealing with lumpy sales volumes, you know, that one, you know, one, one, uh, one or two months out of the year, you're great, and the rest you're struggling. Uh, having to compete on price, um, and that's another one that generally uh, uh, categorizes you as the kind of sheep syndrome. And then the last piece is no consistent marketing initiatives. And that goes into what I categorize as the hamster syndrome. So, you know, some things that are causing these problems, you know, one thing that you constantly hear people talk about is the access to capital for women and a supportive ecosystem. But it's a bit more than that. Um, the other has to do with kind of the practices, you know, okay, I will, Kim, you've twisted my arm. I want to grow, but, but how do I do it? You know, um, what, you know, what practices can I use to make this work um, better than, than others? 
And then, you know, I need, you know, either introductions to customers, partners, um, uh, you know, uh, a network that I don't have, um, in addition to access to capital. So as a result, you know, those things really uh, are some of the causing drivers of why, you know, women-led companies have been in that, you know, challenge of not really growing revenues and jobs. Um, but, you know, all's not lost. You know, when you think of these companies that are, that are uh, started by women and minorities, you know, women are starting companies at over three times the rate than guys are. Um, women generally, uh, when they have companies, they're much more diverse teams than, uh, you know, those homogeneous teams that may be led by guys. And as a result, when teams have that, that diversity, be it gender or race, they far out uh, uh, perform those of just a homogeneous company. And that uh, outperformance is seen generally in revenues and profits. Um, so, you know, something to consider. And then the other side of it is, you know, companies led by women and minorities are, are a higher uh, employer to other women and minorities and give them more opportunities of uh, responsibility than they would have in a majority owned firm. So there's a lot of great characteristics with regards to companies led by women. Um, so, you know, it's not just what I'm sharing with you uh, that this is all, um, you know, statistics and research. Um, as I shared with you, I, uh, you know, founded, uh, led, grew uh, six companies and uh, went through some of this, you know, so I understand the situation. This is some of it is from my own journey when I went from being, you know, uh, either an, uh, a uh, ind uh, individual contributor to even a leader at a corporate environment to being on my own. Some of the challenges uh, and, and mistakes that I uncovered, um, they were, they're numerous, but I figured it out. I was able to, you know, successfully sell a few of the companies that I started. Um, so with my, you know, problem solving these for myself and other companies, I was able to establish that experience, network, and resource to help other business owners like, like you overcome some of these challenges. And so that's kind of the baseline for our talk today. And actually, I put together a, a little guide or white paper to share with folks that's a bit more deeper than, than these suggestions here. So these are what I call 10 keys or secrets that I saw with regards to transforming a lifestyle business and that's generally where you'll help people talk about those businesses that are, you know, 50 to less than a, a mil, you know, less than a few million that are in the position to sell off to somebody else um, and provide you with not just, you know, an income while you're running it, but wealth when you decide to exit. So the first piece is, you know, a commitment to growth. You really need to be committed to growing the company. And, and, and sometimes that's gonna be hard. You know, people are going to, you know, talk you out of it. You're gonna have bad days or whatever, but you know, bare none, you're committed to growing. Um, additionally, you're going to set periodic goals and objectives uh, on an ongoing basis. Sometimes it may be for the year and sometimes it may be for three, five, 10 years, but you've gotta set those goals and objectives and monitor them on an ongoing basis. In addition, you need to take advantage of trends and opportunities that really position you in a niche market leadership. Um, Michelle shared at the start of this that she, you know, went through one of our programs and um, she's an example that has done a great job that has really positioned a CWI as a great leader and uh, a advocate for helping grow not just women business owners, but women business leaders and, and provided some really great uh, solutions to do that. Um, the next is you really need to have a recurring revenue model and revenue streams. Most business owners are more transactional, meaning that it's a one and done relationship with your customer. Either they buy one product or they buy one uh, consulting contract and then that's it but you need to be able to have a recurring stream. When you think of the larger businesses, be it a Netflix or a Costco, all of them have a, a stream that provides for, you know, uh, several bites of the apple on an ongoing basis. And that recurring stream allows you to pay your overhead. Um, it's critical. Um, another piece is you need to invest in uh, a marketing plan and strategy and implement it that allows you to attract and retain customers. The sixth one is uh, working to make certain you continuously 
have your financial house in order. And, uh, and we've got some tools that help with that. But you, you need to understand your financial house is a small business, especially micro business. It's not just uh, your business financials. It's you personally. And so that you can position yourself to get access to uh, resources um, attractively. Uh, if you decide to do business with a medium or very large size customer, they may ask to see what your financials look like so they can be assured that you can you know, be around for a three or five year contract. So that's important. Uh, another piece is that you need to commit to serving, delivering value for your customers. So it's not just, well, gosh, I should be paid five figures or a six figure contract because that's what I need to pay my bills. No, you need to be delivering value that's multiples levels to what you're actually asking people to, um, uh, to uh, contract with you. Uh, you'll need to have a village of people and resources to support you. So your team, partners, uh, network, and so forth, uh, mentors, coaches, and all of those things that are critical. In addition, uh, in order to really grow to this seven uh, uh, and eight figure level, you're going to need uh, access to outside capital to help you grow. And then the last piece is never stop learning. Uh, you really need to make certain that you commit to how can I do what I'm doing better uh, and bettering yourself as well as your business on an ongoing basis. And so with these uh, tips, we're going to go through and look at a few companies that I had a chance to work with uh, that have made these transitions. Um, so the first one is a company that when, they, when we first started working with them, they came in, they were a hamster company, uh, both a hamster and sheep. You know, <laughs> They were uh, in selling uh, diet products uh, for people on the paleo diet. And what they found was there was so much competition that the only place that they could compete was on price and giving away shipping. Very, very competitive. And then additionally, their only channel they were selling was through uh, 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 Amazon. Well, uh, after they went through our program and we worked with them, uh, they really started kind of diving into their customer base and said, you know what? Who is our customer and why are they buying from us? And what do they really need? Uh, one of the things we talk about is, you know, either you can be a vitamin or a, a vaccine or a cure for cancer. And the ideal is that you want to be a, vac a, a, a cure for cancer, worst case, a vaccine. What they found was their customers were not buying for them just because they were on a diet. But no, they were actually doing this because they were overcoming an autoimmune disease and that they really needed a better way to manage their autoimmune diseases. So they transformed their company going through this experience, even changed the name from uh, the one-stop paleo shop to Strength and Food and became a subscription company that helped their, their customers manage uh, the four top autoimmune diseases. Um, and that include a subscription base, so they went from transactional to recurring, and providing nutritional services to help them help their clients better manage the top four autoimmune diseases as well as uh, fighting cancer. Because when you're uh, really first uh, uh, diagnosed with these particular um, uh, 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 afflictions, your first you know uh, ninety to uh, six months are critical. If you don't get that under under wraps, uh, it really can have a devastating impact on your ability to manage uh, that. Uh, lifestyle. Another company uh, example that used um, those there's those tips uh, was a company that actually she created um, uh, 3D printing to create a uh, um, being able to create nail covers. Um, you know, you maybe see heard of Lee Press on nails. Well, you know, when she came up with this new fangled idea to actually allow you to design your own nails. Um, uh, which was, you know, innovative. She initially went where all the other places that you see nails uh, being sold, which was like the, you know, the the drugstore places, CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, those types of places. And what she found was it was very, very competitive. And and so she had to compete there at these, you know, uh, retail channels as well as online. Um, and, you know, the sales were largely transactional. Um, when she really kind of Un, unwrapped what was going on, she found that, you know, 
five percent of her customers were promotional distributors you know people that sell tchotchkes at trade shows and the other type of promotions and that you know they would use her product to put either the business's logo on it or an event or some type of brand on it uh, so that would allow them to have a really unique experience as well as the fact that you know most uh, you know, having a unique thing for the women uh, who are buying from their, um, from their, uh, at their trade shows or events. And so she transitioned her business so that 60% uh, of it was uh, to these promotional distributors uh, and allowed for, you know, a way for them to buy online um, and, and do it on a recurring basis because generally they supported these people on an ongoing basis. Um, Another uh, example that we have here is uh, another one of our um, alums that actually they came into our program and they had a transactional business um, where they were a SharePoint provider and they did implementation projects uh, largely with um, companies that used SharePoint and had an opportunity working with them that they found their niche in their industry so that they could provide support for their customers you know, so it wasn't just setting up their projects, but being able to provide support for them on an ongoing basis, as well as build on a unique um, product that gave them a way to give their customers insights into how their customers were using their products. So that allowed them to have a recurring stream, be that niche player um, with regards to their offering. So how we go about doing this, um, we have a couple ways. For companies that are you know, uh, half million and up, or excuse me, quarter million and up, we have our very intensive uh, uh, Founders Growth Bootcamp program. And uh, we take companies through this exercise. 95% uh, of the program uh, is delivered online. And then afterward, um, you have a pitch day. And for the companies that go through that, we actually now have, this is something that's probably new from when you went through it, Michelle, in our pitch day, we actually select, you know, the top growth plans and those people get a chance to take advantage of a $7,500 um, growth prize that's shared amongst the first. Cool. Uh, and then we also now do a year of follow-up uh, coaching with them. So our goal is to help them develop a uh, playbook. And then, but we and so this is some examples of some of the companies that went through that. Um, but we found that, you know, just as I shared with you, many of the companies that are led by women and minorities don't have that, they're not that quarter million revenues and up, they're much smaller than that. So we launched a program for those businesses that were 50 to 200, to less, you know, less than 250, which is a 60 day program. And it's four uh, workshops, if you will. This is on site, uh, it's in the evening. Uh, six to eight, um, but we provide them with the support and then they also do a pitch afterward. This is a 5K pitch. Uh, and then we provide them with two years of support after the fact. But our goal is that for those companies that really want to grow and want help to do it, uh, this provides a framework to help them with that exercise. And this is just a highlight of some uh, companies that have gone through that. So um, my, my ask back to you would be kind of when you think about your organization, what are your priorities? You know, when you think about how you'd like to grow, do you want to grow your business beyond where it is? Um, do you want to grow it, you know, uh, multi in a higher multiple than where it is? Um, is there a way that you could potentially add value to your customers by improving your model and having a recurring model as opposed to transactional? Is there value for you to increase the profits or profitability of your company? Um, you know, maybe you're a solopreneur and you would like to consider having some resources to help you. Well, consider, you know, maybe uh, hiring not just people that, you know, may help you, but you're concerned that whether or not they're going to do as great a, a job as you are. Um, but, you know, do you, are these people A players? Um, and, and Michelle can probably share with you what she learned about, about hiring <laughs> A players or not. Um, I sure I, I sure can. <laughs> and then the other is, you know, is there value of having an experienced resource to help you and guide you through this process? 
regardless of if you decide to do something with us or uh, any, um, but you know, when you think about if you're going to go through and do it, you might as well do it the best you can and getting the most out of it because there are resources that are available to, that can help you grow and thrive. Um, and then when you think about, okay, well, those sound intriguing, but, um, you know, what's, what are some of the things that may be stopping you or that you stopping your growth, you know, really kind of take a, a, a step back. Sometimes you have to go through and pause a moment. Um, you know, sometimes I find people when they go through that pause process, the pause process can even be in the shower. They may decide, you know what? Um, I just want to give myself in my, you know, 10 minute shower, you know, time to think about, think, uh, on, uh, my business as opposed to in my business, because once I get in front of my computer or I leave out for my first appointment, I'm really focused on, you know, just grinding through what I need to do, be it payroll, employees, customer issue, cash issue or whatever, but it's going to be important for you to take time to pause and think about what you like about what you're doing, where you want to grow, and what you need to do to, um, you know, what you would be open to. You know, the first principle of being committed to growth has to be, you know, really thinking through, is this something I want to do? And if it's not, um, you know, what are my alternatives? And it may be, I'm okay, I'm okay where I am, but it's just, if you are open to that, you know, giving some time to, to think through that. Um, with some of those examples I shared with you, um, one of the things that we worked with companies on is it's not just a function of going through and having someone saying, you should be doing these things, you should be doing these things, but it's also, you know, getting, uh, uh, actually applying those things to what you're doing and actually having some coaching to make certain that what you're applying is worthwhile and there's a fit as opposed to just going through and hearing this great stuff, but not knowing how to apply it. Um, again, uh, as I shared with you, um, this information is not just um, from an ap academic standpoint. Um, while I have been an adjunct uh, uh, professor at a number of business schools, this is from my own heirs of you know, running, growing, and launching six businesses. There's a lot of lumps that I've taken along the way, a lot of mistakes, a lot of PhDs that I got um, going through that, uh, that I, uh, maybe it's some of it's cathartic of wanting to share some of those things with others. Think about, for those of you who have children, you decide, you know what, gosh, I don't want my kids to create, go through the same challenges that I do. Uh, I try that with my son and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes if I just keep at it, he gets it, he gets it. Um, so uh, that's some of, of my uh, mission and journey to, to help. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a bit. So, you know, my goal uh, with all of this is with making this transformation, it does provide for that economic liberty and justice for all, not just having it be that great story about those um, uh, small business stories. I mean, how many great movies have you seen about the guy, um, you know, business owners? And it doesn't say that, you know, that's not wrong because, you know, a lot of us can be inspired by many people I hear are inspired by. They went to see the movie social network and that inspired them to do it or the Steve Jobs story or, you know, a variety of stories that said, gosh, well, I want to do that too. Um, but wouldn't it be great to hear, have that be your, your story, be part of that, how you went through. I mean, that's one of the cool things about hearing about, um, oh, uh, Jackie, can't think of her last name that started Jazzercise her story, you know, not as hyped as the Steve Jobs or one of those, or um, uh, Sarah Blakely, who started Spanx, you know, that's another one, or even Oprah's story, you know, but, you know, your story can be just as um, exciting about how you went through that journey. I mean, we've been at this for a while, ladies, it's our time to really uh, make certain <laughs> that we take advantage of the economics associated with it as well. Um, so, um, my mission, why am I doing this? 
you know, after I sold my sixth company <coughs> that I founded, I, you know, I actually was in a very large um, accelerator through this process. And um, at the time I was over 50, my son had just went to college, so I was an empty nester. And this accelerator was considered one of the prominent ones for early stage companies. And like most accelerators you see, there's a the, lot of the young engineer guys that are largely wearing hoodies. Just a minute, I'm going to take it. <laughs> and I was told, wow, that's kind of interesting that you're running a startup. You really don't fit the profile of most of the other startup founders. And um, I thought, you know what? There are more people starting businesses between 35 to 65 than there are the guys that are the 20 somethings that happen to be engineers right out of school. When I started my business, I started my first business at mm, 32 years old. Um, and, you know, in my generation, there were a number of women who, you know, started their businesses in the 30s or later once they figured that, hey, I can do this. And, and our goal is to help a thousand of those businesses grow uh, million, uh, you know, multiple million dollar businesses and help not just grow them, but help them, you know, get access to capital to grow. Because with this, um, think about a thousand businesses that are at least, you know, uh, five to 10 million or, or up in size and that they have 20 um, employees that they're able to provide livable wages not uh, uh, just, um, uh, you know, uh, minimum wage, that that provides a way for there being a billion dollar impact for them. And so, you know, that's, you know, the mission of, you know, it should be that economic um, liberty and justice for all that anybody who has that passion and wants to take on and solve a problem uh, can do that. <clears throat> So um, in wrapping up, I want to share a few gifts for you. Uh, first, um, I actually have, we actually have a six-page um, guide that steps through those uh, six, um, uh, six uh, excuse me, a six-page guide that goes through those 10 secrets in more details, a little bit of the what and why, and a little bit about the how to go about doing that. Um, so, you know, if you have an interest in getting this free guide, uh, then um, let us know and uh, we'd be happy to um, send that to you. In fact, uh, there's on here, there's a, uh, you can email us at bootcamp at f1stcp.com and just say, send me the 10 keys guide and we'll send this guide to you along with a copy of the slides from today's presentation. Uh, in addition, um, we, can, we are a uh, partner with CWI, and so um, we consider that uh, CWI is a small business ambassador to us, and in recognition of this partnership, we are offering a complimentary admission to our North County Elevate My Business Challenge program, which starts on April the 30th. So, Michelle and her team are going to have the challenge of being able to select some company uh, that's a member uh, to uh, take advantage of that complimentary admission. And um, in addition to that, we're offering uh, all CWI uh, members to attend our Elevate My Business Challenge um, at a discount. The cost for the challenge is uh, $200. This is for companies that are 50 to 250,000 annual revenues. And uh, the cost of, is normally $200, but we're giving a, a $100 discount for doing that. Um, so Michelle, uh, we're gonna share with her information about having access to that. And then our advanced program for companies that have revenues of over $250,000 are offering a discount of $100 for that. And our spring program starts, uh, the orientation for that starts on April the 25th. So included with this are links that will provide you with access to that information. And with that, that's what I wanted to share with everyone today. And so this is an example of the guide you can see to the, to the right of your screen here that um, 
will uh, give you that insight on those uh, secrets to transforming your business. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Michelle. Wow. That, you pack a punch there, Kim. I mean, I, I, a couple of comments. First of all, fabulous. And to all of our attendees, you know, again, without going too elaborate, just in the interest of time, I don't even think you know this, Kim, but, you know, in 2016, when I took your program, um, you know, we were at kind of a tipping point. And it was interesting because there were so many great fundamentals I learned because we definitely wanted to grow. You know, I personally was very committed to see CWI flourish. And, you know, some of the things that I learned by going through the boot camp and doing a pitch at the end, I mean, there's 10,000 things I would do differently um, on the pitch I did for you and your program, but it really forced me um, in a great way to take a look at the business and go, what am I doing? You know, what am I really doing? Because this is my first question to you. And there's at least five or six attendees that asked this, Kim. And they said, you know, I know I want to grow and I know what the goal is, but it's hard figuring out kind of the first steps or next steps or whatever. I mean, what would you give as advice to our attendees that say, I know what the carrot is, but I'm having trouble with step one, step two, step three? Well, so one of the things that was interesting, and this is, uh, sorry, Michelle, to pick on you, but you don't, uh -oh. you don't remember. So one of, as part of the, you know, deciding if this is a fit for you that we do now, now, unfortunately, what you and I went through this while you were in the program, as well as a little bit from the after program coaching was we talked about what's your growth vision. Remember at one mm -hmm. time you were looking at doing something else. And then, I know, I know. <laughs> that you, and then it was just like, okay, okay, I get it. I shouldn't be doing this. And then when you found yeah. some of the, the other things you were doing, you know what? Nobody else is doing that. And that's what I get to focus on. And so mm -hmm. that is some of what we go through and do with, with our, with the folks is going through and thinking about, you know, you have, I mean, if you got to the point of that, you know, uh, revenue ban, you know, especially if you come into the boot camp, a quarter million, you've touched a number of people. It could be in the hundreds or thousands. And really going back and finding out what is unique based on what you've done. So it's not just the thing that's, uh, that's different about our programs. We are not focusing on startup companies. We are focusing on companies that they've been at it. Many of our companies have been at it for a couple, you know, two to heck, some have been through that's at it for 20 years. And they're looking at, hey, I want to grow. And there's, you know, five different options. Which option works best? And we look at it from the standpoint, not just what you see, but looking at how you serve your customers. And that was the exciting journey of what we went through with you, Michelle, because some of the things yeah. that you've done since are really focused on where your strengths lie and really where you're differentiated as opposed to trying to be like everybody else. It's a key thing. And I think, again, you know, these are where some of the questions are coming in, Kim. But, you know, what I took away from that, absolutely, because I was going down a path that, you know, the, the, the reality was don't go there. But what's been so amazing since then, I mean, I have to say, going through the boot camp, I was, I was excited. I was, you know, determined. It's like I got angry, you know, and angry is a strong word because I was like, God, I got frustrated thinking this is what I wanted, but, you know, in going through the boot camp, it was very clear that I'm heading down a path maybe I shouldn't go. Do you know what I mean? That was the, not, not anger, but it, what it showed me was, is how to scale, and I know you use that word very specifically, but in addition, it's like you got to let go to grow, and that's been the mission one since I left the boot camp was that I can, I can only get to where we want to go as an organization if I start bringing on people to do that, and then the question becomes funding, right? So, you know, if you're going to go for funding, that takes a plan as well, and our funding path is modified and it's working for us, but we've now tripled our number of team members, you know, and we've doubled our recurring revenue results. And that's been in a year. I mean, look at a year later, we started a new year. We went through all of 2017 and the fall of 2016. And it was, it's been life changing. It's been frustrating and it's been, you know, the hallelujah trail as well. So um, some of the other questions we've got, and I encourage any small business owner to go through this because you know it's not going to be a magic pill it's going to be a process that you go through to really evaluate your business but you've got so many great resources so that said can you talk a little bit about the funding 
options that you make available for people to understand if you're going to grow, you need funding to do that, whether it's debt or equity financing. Can you talk a little bit about sure. that in the boot camp and some tips for some of the owners that are listening? Sure. Um, so, in a, you know, just a, again, an expansion of when you went through, um, one of the things we look at uh, in both the uh, challenge and the boot camp, you know, we, we introduce this in the challenge, but we really dive deep into it in the boot camp. There's six different uh, options uh, with regards to funding your business, but we really focus on three. There's the, you know, as, as Michelle mentioned, there's the traditional debt, and we talk about what you need to do to be able to, to get there. And we want to help you if that's the path you choose. The second one is equity and, you know, what you need to do to be able to do that. And, you know, we can, you know, connect you to that link. And then the third is revenue-based funding. If you ever watch the Shark Tank show and the, see the bald guy in the middle, Kevin O'Leary, that's generally <laughs> most of his uh, deals are the revenue-based model size and, and what you need to do with regards to, to those things. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and that's the interesting thing is I was talking to one entrepreneur that, you know, is uh, joining us for our spring program is that, you know, when people talk about access to capital, it's similar to, you know, uh, a professional uh, football team or sports team saying, I want to get into the champ championships as opposed to saying, I want to win and get on, uh, you know, get to the, the opportunity to go to, to Disneyland after I'm done. That's what you've got to look at, you know, getting access to funding. It's not, uh, getting access to funding is not just to replace your income. It's got to be a growth story. It's got to be like what Michelle talked about, you know, I went through this, you know, I've grown number of members, I've grown, you know, my team and all these other things. That's the story that you need to be able to have and, and, and the components to say that, that, uh, that funding is the uh, fuel that helps you grow, not the end all be all. And unfortunately, so many people when they say I'm seeking funding, most of their story is I'm going to get this funding and I'm stopping, not necessarily the, uh, that piece. And the other key component of it is with getting access to funding, you've, it's two components. One is you've got to be able to show convincingly that you will return that money back to the, be it lender, investor, you know, uh, partner, that's critical. And the third piece is that it's trust. It's that trust that you can deliver, you know, give that return back. If you ever watch Shark Tanks, you constantly hear them say that, I don't see how I'm going to get my money back. And so some of what you go through in the program is being able to learn what does my business need to look like so that I can be able to get that money back. Because the other side of it is you want to be able to give that investor that money back because the right scenario is that if you give them back, you know, a dime, you get 90 cents and that you're better off for it to get that 90 cents um, and the 10 cents is what you need in order to get to that 90 cents. And so it's a, it's yeah. a oh, go ahead, Kim. I have a question uh, on that. Sorry. I was going to say, it's a different framework, uh, with regards to that. Well, and talk on this because I think this is the other kind of anomaly only because I came from commercial banking, right? But, you know, business owners, and especially I will say women owned businesses, it seems a lot that they have the mindset that I'm going to let, I'm going to ha not have control over my business if I get investor funding. Can you talk a little bit about that, that you're still in control, but now you have partners that are in kind of like in the business and decisions with you um, loosely, directly. Talk a little bit about yeah, what it's I like mean, to bring so, on investors. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the advantage of putting, bringing on the right investor uh, and that's, uh, or funder, you know, and that's, be it if you use bank or equity financing, is that there is shared governance, if you will. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are, you know, good ones and bad ones. But, you know, you, when you decide to take somebody else's money, be it debt or equity, you're going to share that governance with someone else, and you're going to have to have a level of transparency. And that transparency is, you know, hey, you know, it goes back to what I was saying, the trust and the growth method. They're investing in you or they're funding you because you're going to be more valuable tomorrow than you are today. 
and that based on the actions of what you've done, you've presented a trust, you've, you know, developed a, a number of trust and relationship with them that they can see that where you're going to go is going to return back their money plus the return. And there's got to be a return. It's not just, you know, it's not a gift. They expect, you know, a return back. And along that way, when they make that uh, commitment and in investment or funding of you, it's not just, uh, okay, I, got, I took your money and I'm not, you're not going to hear from them along the way, be it a, a traditional debt or investment. There's an ongoing communication. Uh, with equity financing, they may ask for a board seat with um, debt or revenue finance, financing. It may be an advisory role where you've got to all of them. You've got to, you know, provide, you know, ongoing documentation about your financial position as you go through this process. Um, you know, they they may, uh, you know, if you make adjustments to your team and all of those things, that's part of that transparency as well. You know, my my advice is that you, you know, you you do it on a more of a marathon approach as opposed to a sprint. It may be that you use smaller amounts of money. Uh, so that you're able to go through and um, uh, so that you're able to keep more control of what you have as opposed to thinking that you're going to do a one and done. When you look at companies that, especially some of these companies that went public, generally they did a cash infusion, uh, an investment infusion of four to six times, not just one investment. You know, to build that, you know, five, $10 million business, you can do that with, you know, four to six, you know, infusions of capital, but you can do it in small amounts so that you have that level of control of where you're going to go. And you also should be able to select um, investment partners that your interests and values and goals align with. Be careful of those people who say, you know what, I, I want to work with you, but I want 60% or 40% or those types of things. Um, that's, that's critical. I hope that's I pretty funny. Cause there's, yeah, that's a good one. I think, I don't know if you watch, I've seen it. There's a show called, um, Oh gosh, it's on CNBC, Marcus Lamone. Oh yeah. He, the he, right. Yeah. The profit. And that one is a good show to watch as well. Just what, you know, the people process and stuff is going on. But, um, I know we're almost out of time, girl. And I've got like 20,000 other questions. You know, we want you back anytime to lead a webinar, but most definitely, I hope all of you will kind of take advantage of what Kim offered and just, you know, kind of FYI, if any of you are interested to get the uh, e-booklet, which is the Founder's First Guide, 10 Keys to Transforming Your Lifestyle Business into a 10X, right? $10 million enterprise, right, Kim? Right. Um, we will have some recommendations and do a couple of announcements through our association, but I'm sure the reach will be greater than that. And is there any final thought you want to share? Because this was awesome and I hope we can invite you back for more. And I think your program is amazing and you know, cause we have benefited greatly from it. So what else do you want to share as your final, final thoughts? Um, you know, I just, uh, thanks everyone that, you know, you know, dream big, you can do it. Uh, you know, that we're here to help. Um, and, uh, this has been such an exciting journey. I mean, you know, um, uh, Michelle's just a, a great, fantastic example of all the things that she's doing with rocking what you're doing with CWI. So, you know, keep, keep up, keep it, keep it going, girl. <laughs> Woohoo! We'll do that online, right? Anyway, I want to thank all of our attendees. Thank you, Kim, for being our awesome leading lady and thought leader today. And for all of you to know, you know, we're back on occasion with our Women Lead webinars. Again, you know, the whole goal is to share more information and knowledge from, you know, use, utilizing technology. So we want you to lead and achieve and succeed more as a female leader, whether you own a business or if you are a woman who is a career woman or a corporate leader. So that said, I thank you all for joining us and we will see you on the next Women Lead webinar. Thanks for joining